Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to present today. I'm actually um, in the middle of our national consultation sessions. So I'm actually calling from uh, Mianjin on Turbul and Yagura country. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So as Sarah mentioned, the Office for the Arts um, have started work on developing new legislation in terms of protection of Indigenous cultural IP and also stamping out fake Aboriginal style art products. So I'm just going to go through a bit of background and talk a bit about um, the work that we're doing. So as most people would know, Indigenous cultural IP or traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions really refers to First Nations people's knowledge, languages, cultural heritage, art, ecological knowledge, sciences, music, designs, um, dance, fashion, sacred sites. But we see and have heard over the many decades that there are existing gaps in Australian legislation, particularly existing intellectual property law. And some of the gaps include the lack of recognition of communal ownership of ICOP, the recognition of passing down that very important uh, cultural knowledge from generation to generation. Also the limited um, subject matter that's protected under existing IP laws like copyright, for example. Also the limited time of protection. And we also see that there's very limited protection for stories, oral stories, uh, songs, and also cultural knowledge that's passed down through the generations. And so at the moment we have many sort of existing protocols and best practice ethical guidelines that are really used to fill these gaps and promote respect for First Nations arts, culture and knowledge. And some of the examples that we see in the arts and cultural space uh, include Creative Australia's First Nations protocols, uh, the Screen Australia protocols and pathways uh, in the GLAM sector, the Omega Indigenous Roadmap, also in the broadcasting space, SBS and NITV protocols, but also uh, CSIRO are developing a new ICOP policy. And then we also see in the research space and academia, IATSIS have best practice guidelines as well for researchers. So in terms of the First Nations arts and cultural sector, we've seen a number of different inquiries over the decades that have aim to uh, highlight these issues in the Indigenous arts space. So back in 2007, there was a Senate inquiry into the unethical practices in the trading of Indigenous art in Australia, and that saw a committee established to provide recommendations from the number of submissions that were heard across the country from uh, Indigenous artists and uh, galleries and dealers and also industry bodies. And then also 2018, there was a parliamentary inquiry specifically looking at the sort of tourism end of the Indigenous art space into the inauthentic um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art style products as well. Both inquiries had a number of different recommendations. So the 2007 uh, Senate inquiry um, had recommendations such as the introduction of a new resale royalty scheme for uh, visual artists in Australia. And we've seen uh, that law implemented back in 2009, 2010. And also the introduction of uh, an Indigenous art code, which does also exist as well. It's a voluntary code that promotes uh, best practice uh, trading uh, between Indigenous artists and, and galleries and dealers. And then in 2018, uh, the re recommendations that came out of the parliamentary inquiry included uh, an economic analysis by the Productivity Commission into that sort of tourism end of uh, Indigenous art and cultural products, and also the introduction of a new sui generis or standalone law to address protection of Indigenous art as well. And so go just going uh, into the Productivity Commission report, um, this report addressed the sale of inauthentic uh, Aboriginal art in the tourism markets, particularly a lot of the sort of um, lower end products such as, you know, the sort of across the country being sold in the tourism market. Uh, the Productivity, Productivity Commission also saw that $250 million, approximately $250 million is generated in the annual Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art market 
in Australia and also overseas, but that two-thirds of the souvenirs being sold were actually inauthentic uh, First Nations arts products. And so, again, uh, the Commission, the the commission uh, provided recommendations in terms of a mandatory disclosure, disclosure of inauthentic goods by labelling goods in stores and also creating, again, a new law to protect Indigenous cultural IP uh, in Australia. So that's really sort of, I guess, the background of how we've gotten to this um, point. And so under Revive, the new national cultural policy launched by Minister Burke last year in January, um, pages 31 to 34 specifically talk about um, the Australian government's commitment to a new standalone legislation to protect Indigenous art culture and also to stamp, stamp out uh, fake Aboriginal art uh, products in Australia. It's really the first time any Australian government has dedicated resources and staffing to introduce this type of law in Australia. Uh, so we have um, the new team. Um, that I'm leading at uh, Office for the Arts to provide um, the national consultation and lead the policy work Office for the Arts um, for the legislation. We are working on developing two, a two-stage approach. So looking at first doing engagement and consultation around establishing uh, a new um, bill around uh, stamping out fake Aboriginal art in Australia and then later down the track the sort of broader um, approach around introducing a new law for protection of Indigenous cultural IP which will take longer. So as I mentioned we are in the middle of our engagement sessions across Australia. We've been uh, to Tasmania, to South Australia, uh, northern New South Wales um, and there's a number of locations that we're going to across the country. Um, so if you're keen to uh, be involved, uh, please have a look at our website as well for the different locations across Australia. This also follows on from the work that IP Australia did um, a couple of years ago in terms of their scoping study on new standalone legislation to protect and commercialise Indigenous knowledge. Uh, and this uh, scoping study was released and is on their website uh, back in July 2023. Um, in terms of um, First Nations leadership, we will also be working with uh, a number of First Nations experts. Uh, so we'll, there'll be an EOI process next month, which will do a national call out for First Nations um, community members and elders and lawyers and scientists and artists who would want to be part of this working group and advise on uh, the fake art legislation and also the ICOP legislation. And this comes under advice that we received from the National Indigenous Australian Agency, NIAA, as part of the Closing the Gap Priority Form 1. We also work um, really closely with um, other government agencies such as IP Australia, um, NIAA, and also the Copyright Division at the Attorney General's Department. Uh, so we have fortnightly meetings and update everyone on the progress of the work and uh, receive really good input uh, from these government departments. In terms of the fake art legislation, we are aiming to hopefully have it drafted by December this year. Uh, so that's why we've sort of started the consultations quite early. Um, we already have a OPC um, drafter involved who um, will we'll be providing the drafting instructions and policy advice to. Um, in terms of the consultation sessions, we give a bit of background of how we've sort of gotten to this point and then go through a range of questions which talk to the issues um, that should be considered or could be considered um, in both the fake art legislation and the ICAP legislation. Uh, so looking at issues around the actual subject matter of the legislation, uh, the scope of rights, term of protection, who the rights holders or the beneficiaries should be, um, enforcement provisions and penalties, but also looking at things around, uh, looking at issues around sort of the definition of what fake art is, um, if there should be a difference between sort of traditional and contemporary art, for example. Um, we're also looking at overseas to other um, 
national laws in other countries that are dealing or dealt with similar issues around protection of Indigenous knowledge and culture. So, for example, uh, the Indigenous Knowledge Act uh, in South Africa of 2021, also uh, in Panama back in 2000, there was a special system for collective intellectual property rights of Indigenous peoples of Panama. Um, the uh, sort of consumer type law in the US, the Indian Arts and Craft Act 1990, uh, and also a, a quite a new law in Mexico, the Federal Law for Protection of Cultural Heritage of Indigenous and Afro-Mexican Peoples and Communities 2022. Um, and then also, I guess, in terms of the work that's happening at um, the United Nations level, at the World Intellectual Property Organization, there are a number of uh, draft instruments around protection of um, Indigenous knowledge and culture and also um, biological um, uh, resources and genetic resources as well. So we also look at those draft instruments um, to really sort of guide the work that we're doing uh, in this space as well. But. Um, in terms of the um, website, we have uh, a dedicated page on ICIP at the Office of the Arts that talks about the work that we're doing. Um, we're also welcoming uh, written sub online written submissions um, from any interested parties. Uh, that's a, the link to the National Cultural Policy on the Office of the Arts website. We'll also be holding three Zoom sessions in June and the dates will be on the website very soon um, to sort of capture any other people who are unable to attend the, um, the uh, national engagement sessions that we're doing across the country. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments as well. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, uh, I'm working uh, at a university and a lot of universities are, or some universities are adopting local um, ICIP protocols. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that, um, and it's really exciting to hear about this legislation because I think it's, it's very sorely needed, and um, do, would you say that after le the legislation is finished and adopted, would you say that there'd still be a need to adopt local ICIP protocols or would this kind of be enough to cover or, or you know, inform the university's approach? Yeah, great question. Um, I think in terms of sort of 